you know, binocular vision is really um, difficult for some doctors to get excited about. Some doctors kind of shy away from it. Um, but as more and more doctors become really interested in myopia management, I think it's really um, very important that we continue to make this part of the discussion. Um, as I was hearing your last comments, I was thinking about um, how you talked about accommodation and um, one that I am always really um, putting at the top of my list to do with my patients is to check their lag of accommodation uh, and how, you know, you'll see some studies that say a high lag of accommodation is associated with progressive myopia. But then I have also seen and heard sometimes that there's a little dispute about that. Could you talk to us a little bit more about that, Kathy? Well, again, I think that um, if you're measuring a lag of accommodation, uh, you want you want to say, okay, if accommodation and convergence are not in the same place, what does that really mean? And so if you're needing to uh, converge in order to be in the right place and you absolutely need to accommodate to a high level because what you're looking at, for example, is small or detailed, then there it may be more of an issue that there is that lag of accommodation. If there's a small lag of accommodation or even a moderate lag of accommodation, but what the person is looking at is not so precise or not so small or not so detailed, they may not uh, feel it, they may not notice it, and they may not over time have a big effect from it. Um, I think that when we have someone who has to do uh, a lot of near work, especially when print gets smaller uh, and, you know, everything is crowded more on a page, that may be different. But, you know, today a lot of students are working on screens. So if they have an issue, they can make it bigger. You know, they can change the spacing between the paragraphs. They can change how wide the lines are. And I don't know whether they always have the freedom in school to do that with the text that they're presented with. And maybe a lot of to the actual text, they're reading a book. And so, uh, and also they tend to sit a little bit further back. So the demand on even the convergence is a little bit less because I've always over the years had children come in and just say, oh, I don't have a problem. And I asked them, well, how do you hold the book? And you put it, you know, you hand it to them about where you know they should hold it. And the first thing they do is move it a little bit away from them. And as long as the print in the book is large enough, they, that's all they do. They just extend it out a little bit. And then they don't, at least they don't feel they have a problem. And in some cases, uh, they don't uh, have an issue going back and forth. Uh, but that's something else that I do a lot with patients is um, I hand them a near point card and maybe I have them look at the first or second paragraph on a near point card. And then I put up uh, maybe a 20, 25 line across the room and I ask them to just go back and forth, not to just clear. So as soon as it's clear, they should clear enough when they look close there. And I asked them to go back and forth for 30 seconds or a minute and to, to tell me if either in either place things get blurry or more challenging to clear. Sometimes you can see that because I usually stand to the side and I can watch their eyes go back and forth and I can see them slow down. And, um, and I think when someone demonstrates that, especially if they're in a situation where they have to do more of that, they're not gonna have the stamina and stability and it probably does drive their nearsightedness. Um, you know, I had, I had a, a very high level athlete here the other day who was here ostensibly for some sports vision uh, testing and she was about a one diopter myope and she was wearing contact lenses and I could see that she didn't have a lot of good uh, stamina and stability of binocularity in some ways. And I, so I had her look back and forth and, and she had difficulty um, clearing the near print. She could do it, but it, she was telling me she could feel the effort. And she said, you know, when I think about it, I notice that myself, that if I'm studying and I'm on my computer and then I look up, it's not always clear right away. And I put some plus it near and, um, she went, oh, wow, you know, this is unbelievable. I can just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it's it's really easy to do. And my eyes are already more comfortable. And I, I 
don't remember at what age she became myopic, but I have to tell you, it's likely we could probably reduce some of that for her because it probably came, again, from a binocular vision issue. Um, and whether if she needed some, uh, uh, she wasn't terribly ESO or EXO. So sometimes in those patients, especially Paul, as you were mentioning, if they're ESO, I will put them in a multifocal lens. Uh, I used to love the lens, and I don't remember the name of it, but I think it was Cooper Vision had a lens that had about a plus one ad. And I used to use that a lot, uh, and then they stopped making it. That's the ProClear um, and EP. The optics what was it called? It was called ProClear EP. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, we used um, to fit a ton and that of those. was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because... It didn't really seem to interfere uh, in any way because some of the lenses, you know, even with a distance centered uh, lens, sometimes there seems to be some issue uh, that the near part gets in the way a little bit, depending on their pupil size and how much the lens moves. But that lens was great. And um, I think the um, uh, the newer VTI lens the uh, seems to be one that, that we can potentially use, uh, especially in kids. I'm not sure it works as well for adults, or at least I haven't had the experience that it works as well for some of my adults, but it, it does work for the kids. And I've seen, you know, patients who were 20 of East getting more myopic, and I put, you know, even a multifocal with a high ad, like, like the studies show, and, you know, they go to ortho. So they have a high ACA ratio, potentially, and although they don't always test it as high as the response that I seem to get with the contact lens, but it does seem to to slow things down. Um, and so I, again, it's just another tool in the toolbox. And it doesn't mean that that patient wouldn't ultimately become a, a patient where you would think about, okay. But I know that uh, some people feel, and again, it really does depend on, on their cornea. Uh, you know, sometimes for some of the low, um, low myopes, when they just have, you know, minus one or minus two, they may not be the best candidate for orthokeratology. Um, and that's where a soft multifocal lens or plus veneer or whatever uh, they're interested in using and wearing uh, really, I think, takes the stress off and off their system, helps to rebalance accommodation and convergence. And I think, at least in my experience, it seems to slow down the progression of myopia. I mean, we, we can't test an individual person and say, well, this is what would have happened if we didn't do it. Here's what happens if we do. Although um, Brian Holden uh, Vision Institute in Australia does have an online calculator where you can go in and say, here's the person's age and here's how myopic they are today. And here's roughly the likelihood of how myopic they'll be in you know, one year, two year, five years with treatment or without treatment. And that's a nice thing to be able to show uh, parents, because you, you're not making it up. They've done a lot of work and a lot of study for a long time, and it's a free calculator that you can use online. It's very nice, and it's very nice to use.